time about um, poverty traps, equilibria, nonlinear systems, stability, and what all that meant in the context of economic growth. Okay, so we ended that with a discussion on sensitivity analysis and the value of sensitivity analysis for making aid decisions. Okay, now we're going to go another step. Um, as engineers, we want to know the impact of technology on development, right? That's really uh, important to us. Yes? Just really quick, it's problem 3.10. 3.10, okay, thank you. Um, so we want to understand what the impacts of technology, technologies are on development. And so we're going to study that analytically today. The second thing we'll be studying is the notion of breaking a poverty trap, okay? Now, um, first thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little review to get us started because I need these ideas fresh in your mind. Uh, remember, we had these parameters, the savings parameter, growth parameter, depreciation parameter, and that A parameter. The A parameter, remember that was for this function. It went up like, you know, like an S shape, and it's how steep that step, smooth step is. So what I did is, is in, the pre in the previous lecture, we had uh, a change in P from 30 to 40, remembering that P represented the quality of technology that helped people make money, okay? Remember, it was S, P, F of C, okay? Now, so we studied the impact of going from low technology to high technology, that is a value of P equal 30 to a P equal 40 case, and um, what's interesting about this is, is that the blue line moves, okay? So here at the top is the blue line, and uh, it's at some value that ends over here somewhere. But look, if you change to peak 40, it ends higher and has a bigger hump, and then the intersection points with the red line is the crucial issue. They change. In fact, they change only for the better. In particular, Remember, this is our poverty trap with the upper limit of CT. The width of that poverty trap does what? Goes from here over to here, it decreases, right? That's good. That means it'll be easier if people can make money to get out of poverty and become wealthy. Second of all, the, this one moves over here. This, this uh, equilibrium point moves over to this equilibrium point which means that the country will also only get wealthier, too. So only good things are coming from that improvement of technology, okay? Now, you say that's completely unrealistic because what you did is you took 30 and you just flipped it to 40. That's completely unrealistic because in reality, you know that technology <coughs> sort of comes to a country and it slowly diffuses through the country. It's slowly adopted. Or you diffuse a technology and then it's improved upon, improved upon, improved upon, and that is represented in this parameter going from 30 to 40. So the parameter does not jump from 30 to 40. It's not like all of a sudden you end up with the shrinking of the poverty trap. Your hope is, is that by slowly improving P, you will shrink the poverty trap. You go to Honduras on spring break, you introduce a technology, you help out 20 people. Not much impact at the country level, okay? Very, very, very small, okay? But if it happens that that spreads all through the country, yeah, it diffuses through the country, it can have a big impact, okay? So that's the issue we're gonna, um, talk about today. So somehow the way um, um, Rogers who was the original inventor of these ideas, um, a sociologist actually, um, he says that technology adoption it comes through diffusion <coughs> and he draws something like a bell curve and he says uh, he plots time on the horizontal axis and he plots the number of adopters on the vertical axis. And what he says is so, time goes on, all of a sudden, the, the, the technology's introduced. You notice a little period in there, and everybody kind of ignores <laughs> it, and then somebody starts buying it and saying it's really great. You know, the early adopters, 
right? The first people to buy the first iPhone or the first people to buy some other new technology, it's the information spreads, more and more adopters, more and more adopters until it peaks out and then everybody's got one that kind of dies off. Right? So that's a, a generic curve for how a technology is adopted. In terms of a plot, it has the number of adopters over time. At some point, you're not going back and buying the iPhone 3C. Okay? It's, I don't know, five years old. So you, uh, you, this, this curve is always going to um, trail off. Now, in a country, then, these adopters aren't all in one city. They're all over the country. So somehow, there's a diffusion network. And they, they study, they've studied this quite a bit, and some of the things that help technology diffuse, of course, is the media, newspapers. It also, um, you know how it is with your friends, you're sitting around and your everybody always now is looking at their phone and hardly talking with each other. So what happens is somebody looks over my shoulder and says, what is that? Well, that's uh, this app or whatever, so it's visible. The technology, its functionality is relatively visible, so everybody sees that around you and it spreads and you think well that was only my friend yeah but <laughs> tomorrow they tell their friends or their friends see him and it, it spreads these things these ideas spread very fast or you get some you you my wife and i are, are into emojis these days so um, you, you send somebody an emoji and uh they they're like hey where'd you get that <laughs> you know and you say well i got it here and so these things spread really quick actually so it's technology spread in a more general context, the book by Rogers is, is about the diffusion of innovations. So it's not just technologies necessarily, it's just innovations in general. Okay? But we're going to study um, the technology case and notions of an adopter curve like that. Okay, so what happens if a technology diffuse, diffuses through a country? Of course, this diffusion is affected by wealth. If people can't buy iPhones, they're not going to spread. Somehow, it's, having money to buy the technologies or use, operate the technologies is certainly important. Communications, as I said a moment, of many sorts, media, global communications, local communications, culture. Some technologies don't spread because people simply don't, they don't fit the culture. They don't fit what people like. Okay? Um, and of course, transportation, because transportation also says, you know, I'm driving home and I'm showing somebody my technology. I'm driving here and showing somebody my technology. And so that helps things sort of diffuse and spread around. So what I'm going to do is, is model this. Um, and the model, I'm going to just model it being P of T rather than a constant P. Okay, it's going to be time varying. Okay, and I'm going to have it have dynamics. I'm going to move P of T in a certain way. Um, and via according to a, a dynamical system. Um, so it's going to go like this. Um, some standard models for diffusions of it, diffusion of innovations <laughs> or technology look like an equation at the top. This is a nonlinear difference equation. It's easy to understand. Let me explain why. Um, N is the number of adopters. Now, that left-hand side, you know now, it's just a slope, right? It's a derivative. It's just a slope. Now, you got to pick this guy apart. This is the easiest way to... Um, to start with that is to let beta be zero. Kill beta. That term's gone, so all I have is alpha k minus alpha n. Let's suppose k is zero. Then all I have is minus alpha n. So if dn dt is equal to minus alpha n and n starts out positive, the slope is negative and it's gonna go down, right? Number of adopters will decrease. On the other hand, if we're positive, it could go up. Now, with this k here, what I'll just tell you is you have alpha k minus alpha n. So can somebody, let's see if somebody can simulate this in their head. Tell me, or there's other ways to do this. Tell me what happens, uh, in that case, still beta equals zero. What happens to n of t as t goes to infinity um, for the case where alpha is positive and k is positive, where does n of t go? It's a k. Exactly. It's k. Why? Why did you say that? Because when k is equal to n of t, then we know the slope is zero. Exactly. You, you computed the equilibrium. <laughs> 
That's what you did. That's exactly right. So what he did is he said, well, just force this to go to zero. You can intuitively see it's going to be going up. Got, and that I mean, it must mean it's upper bounded stops. So that's right. OK, so now let's go to um, a second case. Let's, let's kill alpha. Let alpha be 0, and let beta be positive. And then we have this term times this term. Now, when you want to understand dynamics, a, a great place to start is with equilibria again. Alex, don't answer this question. Somebody else. What are the equilibria? And I got I when you stat, when you're asked that question, the first thing you do is let the NDT equal zero. <coughs> that means equilibrium. Remember the pendulum down, the pendulum up. It's not moving. So D N D T is equal to zero. What happens? Solve for N, right? So the right hand side is solve for n. And beta is a constant, k is a constant. I've got n times quantity k minus n. And I want to solve for n. Anyone? It's quadratic. It's, it, it's, uh, it's quadratic, but it's a little easier because it's already factored, right? So n of t is equal to 0. n equals 0 is one case. N of t is equal to k. And if t is equal to k is the second case. Because that means, remember this guy's gone, and a zero would cause this to be zero, or n equal k will cause it to be gone. So if you start with the number of adopters as zero, it'll be stuck at zero. If you bump it off a of zero, it'll go to k. Just like the other case, actually. It's interesting, right? The way the algebra is set up here, it'll go in that case. Now, it turns out that um, if it's alpha plus beta k over n, um, well, what do you think? Then I've got to solve again for the equilibria. The equilibria in this case, guess what? One will be at k, because this term's still there. The other one, you just solve that equation, right? OK, so, so you can actually um, um, solve this. but. In the end, what does this guy look like for typical cases? It's simply this. That's all it is. It's just a curve that goes like this. It's that easy. And you say, why is that? Well, guess what? Go back here, the adopter curve, <coughs> and integrate it. What is, what is the, int it, if you run this through an integration, Okay, in other words, you just start summing, sum like this, across here. What happens? Can you envision what's going to happen to the sum? Integrals to sum, right? So what's going to happen to the sum? What shape is it? It goes, yeah, exactly. It goes just like up like that. That's all the differential equation is doing. That's all it's doing. Is it's just integrating a curve like this, conceptually. Okay? Okay, questions before I go on? Constants that I can pick to represent the dynamics of diffusion in a country. Okay, so if I introduce a country in a country a certain technology, it may spread faster or slower, for instance, or reach more adopters and so forth. So you're going to pick <coughs> alpha, beta, and k to represent a country. So are these alpha, beta, and k dependent on those four factors which you told for communication, transportation? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to depend on a lot of things. You may, and, and getting those, those parameters can be hard. Yeah. Because you may, like, let's say you did this. You introduced, the iPhone was first in terms of these things. Well, it wasn't first, but popular first. It spreads through a country. You get the data, and you get alpha, beta, and K. Google, or Android comes along. They say, well, basically, it's going to be the same. They've got the parameters, right? So you use experiments often to develop parameters like this. So like, is, is there a way for like, having a new, fixing a numerical values for these things? Because uh, how do you define how good is the transformation, like a transportation in a country? You give it a value between 0 to 10, or is, is that like the weight-based weight 
Usually in these these kind of approaches, you're not going to go to that low level of detail in terms of the modeling. Yeah. So we just. But you could. I think we just we just depend on the heuristics and. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Generally, for this, when you gender generally when you try to model systems that are very very big, you have you get you abstract, and have very high level representations. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so here's the thing. I want to link these together. So I want to now study the impact of technology diffusion on capital. Okay. So remember our equation right here. There's a difference. I've got, rather than P here, if you let Pn equal zero, this is the same as what we had before, right? Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Pn as a constant multiplied by N of T, and I'm going to add it to P, and then I'm going to put that in my money equation. Okay? That makes sense? You know what that P, that N of T is going to do. N of T is going to go like this. So all I'm going to do is have N of T go like this, and I'm going to scale by this P, and that's going to increase P to... Uh, or, uh, Pn is delta P plus K, so P plus Pn N of T will go to P plus delta P. Therefore, I'm simply going to increase P. That's all I'm doing via N. Now, what I'd like you to do is criticize my model. I mean, this was, you know, it's like the first thing I thought of. Okay? It's accurate in, the sen in one sense because it's saying, remember, this is the production function. This function says how much money you'll make if you own a certain amount of capital, like a tractor or whatever. The P would represent a higher and higher quality tractor. So I'm moving P up from a low value to a higher value. Sounds good, right? Seems pretty reasonable. So let's just say equation one's okay. Is equation two okay? Now, I just introduced it, okay? Is this equation okay, though? Are one and two, uh, what I really want to know is the first equation and the second equation okay together. When you have differential equations, you do something called coupling. So, this equation impacts this equation, right? The very nature of the evolution of this equation will depend on the adoption of the technology. It will affect the rate at which it's adopted, how fast P will increase, okay? What about the other direction? In other words, should capitals like money? Yeah, like it's should C in fact here. It's not there, so it's not there. The coupling is not bidirectional. Yeah. Why would it be there? Well, if you if you have more capital, then people will have more money to buy the technology. Exactly. So. So if you have more capital, you have more money in the country, you'll be able to adopt faster. So, I didn't do this. It's not in the simulations I'm going to show, but where would, how would you change the second equation to model this fact? I don't know, it should, it should actually scale the N of T or there. Which where, where? Here? Yes. No, but that would actually decrease it. I think C. it should be C, C K minus N of T. <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. C, look, listen, C is, is that can go negative. C itself is positive. Yes. Okay, so um, somehow this equation is like this, right? If you have more C, what does the shape of that guy look like? It kind of goes back like this. It becomes steeper, right? And maybe it goes up. So how do I do that in the equation? It's very simple. What do you think, Tyler? We generally scale the whole Multiply. Multiply, exactly. Yeah, scale the whole equation. Yeah, what do you say? Aren't um, A and B functions of C? Alpha and beta? Yeah, because that's like the rate of like how it diffuses, right? Yeah, you could certainly represent it that way also. So we have two proposals now, yes. How would capital affect how many adopters? Because isn't capital non-monetary? 
So well, here's the problem. Cap my problem here is is that um, calling it capital, you normally think of it indeed as you know this is capital. This is cash in hand, right? So um, yes, that's a problem. I am actually cheating here, kind of misusing the terminology. Uh, I'm thinking of capital as like all of that money and yes. I think having more capital also it also impacts indirectly the adopter rate. True. Rate it was pure if capital. You, it was say if you have a tractor and if you have a better, better efficient tractor, you would be saving more money, and in that way, you have more money to buy some new technology. So. Well, that's true, and and, and if you have. Uh, if you have better infrastructure, like better buildings, better rooms, you can easily put a computer in it and improve your technology. So there's a capital does affect, but I think money affects and capital affects. So I'm just throwing it all together. So I think Tyler's proposal was put C right there. Okay. Well, if C goes up, then the, the, this is going to increase this slope, make it go up faster. Um, your proposal was to take alpha and beta and incorporate C, right? Somehow. It's, it's going to be trickier. It would I'm not be like alpha or C. <clears throat> yeah, right, right. I, I think you're right. Either one's worth. Yeah, it's the same thing. Well, it's close to the same thing. I guess when you pull it out in front, you assume that your capital affects alpha and beta kind of in the same way. Yes. But if you put it inside the parentheses and you make them functions, then you say that um, capital affects alpha differently than it affects beta. Exactly. So and you can put you can put capital. Does it make sense to make it K of C? Why not, right? Can, uh, that's what Why I'm not? Saying. Because you're going to end up more adopters. Because K is the ultimate value. Tyler, I was going to say with the multiplier, it'll affect the rate, so it'll be adopted faster. But there's not more people, but it won't affect the equilibrium points. So it'd still be equaling out to like you know the total number of adopters. You can't have any higher than. The number of people you have. So yeah, that's true. Trust. Right, right. Okay, so there's all kinds of ways to model this. Why didn't I put one of these in? Because it makes it a lot more fun just to discuss it. Because you, you guys know what's going to happen if we do those things, right? Can if you know that, why do I need to do it? Can we just multiply that K by C of T? That's what we were just, the K? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do an example. Um, there's all my values. Um, I, you know, here's the earlier values. Um, P is uh, um, 30, um, delta P is 10, so that means I'm going to go from 30 P at P to 40. So now I'm going to use dynamics and go from one to the other rather than just switching it. Okay, now here's the plots. Let me explain these plots because they're a little unusual actually. Some non-intuitive things are going to happen here, okay? What I do is I take the capital ratio, C, and I start it at different points. Do you see where I'm starting at different points? All the way up to four, okay? Just, just grid it along this axis. And then what I do is I rerun the simulation. For each initial condition, I rerun the simulation. Technology diffusion is the same because capital doesn't affect technology diffusion in my model. But, Here's the thing, if um, this, this curve right here is the simulation of dn dt, right? That's n of t in the model. It is affecting top, okay? Now, um, it gets, it's a little unusual. Let's though talk about some clear cases. First of all, can you see that there is a poverty trap? We're, we're looking at it a different way now, right? There's a poverty trap, though. The poverty trap somehow is down here, right? Because these are the poor guys. They start out with a little money, the poor get poorer, and it dies away, and they, they all die, okay? Now, um, on the other hand, if I'm above there, I, I, this looks good. I mean, it comes up like this. So what's sort of depressing is, is this technology is such that it's making people wealthier, but it's not doing it fast enough to help these people. See what I'm saying? The trap's still there. The, the change in from P equal 30 to P equal 40 doesn't save everyone, okay? Now, um, that's all fine. That, those are the same ideas we've been talking about 
um, la you know, earlier this lecture and, and in the last lecture. But here's what's interesting. If you start out up there at four, um, it's, there's sort of an unusual behavior. So it's coming down, okay, in money, but see, this guy starts saving it, starts increasing, so it comes down, then it comes back up. That is not the behavior we saw last class period, right? Before, it was always goes up or comes down. It hit the equilibrium we called CE, right? It was always that case. But now it's going down and it's coming back up, and that's because it's going down because it's like the people are getting poorer and poorer and poorer, but then the technology diffuses and it saves them and brings them back up. Isn't that cool? Now, um, honestly, you can't really know that something like that's going to happen real easy. I mean, you, you could maybe, if you work with a system a lot, you'd know that something like that would happen, but you need to do simulations. Not only your systems sometimes you know, the, the, but the behaviors they produce are, are sort of unusual, um, not easy to predict um, intuitively, so you have to have to do mathematical analysis or computational analysis to figure out what's going on. Here we're doing computational analysis, okay? And we can sort of see what's going on. Now, um, but, you know, things are pretty good here because technology diffuses, comes up to here, and it ranks it yanks the wall up and like everything's okay in the end. But what I want to do is, yes, Tyler? I was say, I think it'd be cool to also plot on that how the equilibrium points are changing over time. Just so you can kind of see what they would be at the beginning and then what they are at the end, see how much they change. Yeah, um, just a second. Let, let me come back to your point. I, I hear you loud and clear. Um, let me show you this mess first. Okay, this is what's called a phase plane. This is standard method in nonlinear system analysis to study a two-dimensional system. All right. So I want to—I got to define my axes here before I explain the pretty picture. Uh, on the horizontal axis, it's C. Okay. On the vertical axis, it's not Z; it's N. Okay. Number of adopters on this axis, C on this axis. Now, in this particular program, what you do is you enter, see the equations up there on the far left? Those are the equations that I just introduced. It's the nonlinear differential equations to represent the combined adopter curve and capital curve. And there's my values. In MATLAB, what you can do with this script is you go up and you go dot, and it goes boom, and it creates a line going from here up to some point. Okay? What is it doing? So time is hidden here. Time moves along the blue line. Okay? So this is a way to take the previous plot and put it on one plane. Rather than, you know, I plotted in that C of t and n of t, right? Now I'm plotting n versus c, and time moves trajectories across the plane. Now, um, so I go up there and I get punch happy and just keep pressing buttons and every black dot here is where I click with my mouse and then the resulting blue line is a trajectory of how the system behaves. You might say, huh, you know, that's kind of, why is that giving you insight? Well, let me explain. The red dots um, for this system are the equilibria. Now, these aren't the equilibria you're referring to. These are the equilibria. Now, uh, this point right there, that one on the right, that point is, not, now you've got equilibrium, it's, it's two-dimensional now. It's this and this, okay? Um, next, question. What is this point right there, top left? What is that point? It's C equal zero, N equal K. Right, makes sense, right? We talked about that as an equilibrium, no problem. Now, um, let's go back. 
The one on the right, stable or unstable? Stable. Because if you start all around it, all the trajectories move towards it, right? You perturb off that red dot, it's going to come right back to it. One on the far left, stable or unstable? Stable. Exactly. Why? Because that's the poor get poorer. That's that equilibrium. Now, the tricky one is the middle one. That's why I was avoiding it. The tricky one, um, it's hard to see what's happening from the plot. You really need to zoom in, okay? But I can explain a few things. Um, first one is, forget about being down here. Just say that n is equal to k, okay? n is equal to k. So you're on the top. So if I start up there and I perturb to the right and see, where does it go? To the right, good. It goes over to the right dot. If I start at the middle dot and I perturb a little to the left, where does it go? Left dot. Looks like an unstable equilibrium, right? It is, in fact. But there's an unusual thing in this case. Because if I start, see how, see how I chose a bunch of black dots right up along here? Look what happened when I did that. Those black dots went and they split and they went off. But there's one special case. Can somebody tell me, is there a black dot such that it will go to the equilibrium? Is there one? I couldn't hit it. You'd have to hit it numerically within a 10 to the minus 20th or something. But where would it be? Anyone? It would actually be, well, it's on a line between that point and the red dot. That's where it's at. But it is in a special place such that the trajectory will go directly to the red dot and stick there. Now, that's very unusual. So think about what's happening. You get right at the right point, it'll go right to it. If you get off a little bit, it'll go away from it, go away from it like that. This is what's called a saddle point equilibrium. It's a very easy idea. It's called saddle point because you sit in the saddle of a horse. Think about it for a minute. You're in the saddle of a horse. You take a ball. And you put it at the top of the saddle, and you let go. What, what happens? It goes down and lands right in the middle of the saddle. But if you perturb that, that this way, it falls off the horse. So it's unstable in that direction. It's stable in this direction. See, it's quite a bit more sophisticated than the inverted pendulum, right? It, it is a, technically, it's called an unstable equilibrium. Okay? But it has a very unusual property of, of actually, in some cases, when you perturb off it, it'll come back to it, okay? So now, to Tyler's question on, about the equilibria, can you answer it yourself or not? What do you mean, like? Well, you said, you said, well, how would the equilibria change? Well, yeah, no, I just thought it'd be interesting to like, put it on the graph and visualize it. I yeah. Can see, I, can, I can see in my head how they change. Yes, exactly. It'd be I thought interesting you could. to see how much they change. How much they change. So what you want to explain what you thought I know what yeah, you're talking example, about. You go back to the Yeah. Go back to here. Yeah. For example, on the top plot, uh, uh, there might be an equilibrium point, I don't know, it looks like around point eight ish maybe. Um, whereas on the far right after You mean you mean here? Yeah, yeah. We're on the far right after some time it might I uh, get You don't know where it's gonna yeah, be, exactly. right? Exactly. It could be much closer to zero, it could not. It, it, it work. It should be closer to zero, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So do you see what he's saying? See, the, the poverty trap, the CT threshold from before would be here. But it, it, as the technology is introduced, you know P increases, therefore the poverty trap shrinks. Therefore that equilibrium is moving. All right? It's coming down. Now the reason I was a little hesitant to answer is because we wouldn't technically call that an equilibrium because it's moving. But you're right. You're thinking about it, the dynamics the right way. That's exactly what's happening. You know what? It, so you did it in terms of there. So you said C was at about 0.8, whatever it is, and it goes down. Well, look. What, what's going on here is, so I was punching it here, too, for this reason. See, it's somewhere down around here. And, and if you study this, take a line and run it straight up, it moved down. 
It's the same idea on this on the 2D plot. Okay, any questions? I mean, um, the uh, methods like this um, really are quite useful um, to understand dynamics of systems like this. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of things you can do with a plot like this to give yourself an understanding of development. The other thing you can do is you realize that if I take the parameters alpha, beta, k, s, p, g, d, remember them all? And if something changes in a country, you can perturb those parameters if you know they're different. And then what happens to this? This is the pretty picture. The pretty picture shifts. The dynamics shift, and you're like, oh, crap. Things are going to be a lot worse because of that change in the country. Or, oh, my goodness, it's going to get better, faster. See what I'm saying? The dynamic, this is the way a dynamical system person thinks of the broad development problem in the country. Okay? You want to understand the facts of various things. And for us, in humanitarian engineering, we want to fact, understand the effect of technology, right? We want to know that what we're doing will have an impact. History says it does. History, you study the history of, uh, of technology and impact on development, it's just unequivocal. It's very clear technology is a major impact, has a major impact on development, okay? If you want to read about that, and I like the nice history in uh, William Easterly's uh, recent book, The Tyranny of the Experts. Okay, um, next. A uh, few conclusions. Um, so the poverty trap shifts different than constant changes to P, but we get the expected results. And what we meant there is just what Ty the way Tyler was thinking, and that is, is, is you know, the equal, it's like the equilibrium is changing over time. You could say that. That's what Tyler was saying. I think that's a fine way to think about it, um, even though technically wouldn't, you wouldn't call that an equilibrium then, but it doesn't matter to me. It matters that you're thinking about the dynamics correctly. Um, and uh, that change is um, the movement from this point over to the left of that point, showing that when technology increases over time, the poverty trap shrinks too, which is, of course, that's, that's a very crucial issue, okay? Um, next. Uh, now that dip below the final value, we talked about that in some detail, and then that, that lovely uh, saddle point equilibrium um, in the shrinking region of initial conditions um, for the poverty trap. Okay, switch it, slight switch in subjects then. You understand, so technology shrinks poverty traps. That's the main message, okay? In a complicated way, but it shrinks poverty traps. Now what we're going to do is we're going to ask the question of how to break poverty traps. And in particular, I'm going to have some focus on Jeffrey Sachs' claim that we can, you know, remember he said we could give $70 per person in these countries and that would solve the problem. We would get them out of the poverty trap, they'd get on the right side of it, and they'd go up and have economic growth and be, you know, fat and happy like all of the Americans, right? Um, so how do we represent that? So the first thing I'm going to do is do something uh, to simplify a little bit. I want to take the derivative, okay? I want to say it's approximated by the Euler. This is the Euler approximation to the derivative. So I just take, this is just a slope, um, C, C of kt minus C of kt minus t over t, okay? Um, that's, you know, essentially rise over run. And uh, then what I'm going to do, I'm going to rewrite the equation, the ck plus 1 equals ck. And then I'm just, everywhere I had a, a T before, I'm just going to put a K. All right, the standard approach to discretization. And I, uh, this is my minus uh, D, C of T. I dump G. Why? Because I'm assuming here that this is one person, not a country. This is a huge jump to jump by assuming that a model developed for a country can be used for one person. I get that. But when you study the literature, it's hard to get a model for one person, economic development for one person. We've been working on it for, for some time, and it's, it's, there's just not much in the literature 
on how to do that. Next one is going to be IR prime C. This is the return on investment gain. And then I'll have, I'll have CIU of K, which is the capital investment gain. And then I'm going to have PR, which is provisioning. And this, this PR is simply going to be a pulse of X dollars on some time in your life. And we want to see if that will jump you up, increase your capital to a point that you jump out of the poverty trap and take off on your own. Okay? We're going to use the bank, like earlier, the pocket. We're going to have a, two accumulations of wealth, though. So I'm going to assume that I've got wealth in my pocket, just like we started out way back in, way back when with our poor guy with PID and all that. I got, poor, I got money in my pocket. But I'm also going to have capital, my tractor, my rake, my shovel. Okay? I'm going to have two things. Um, the PI spending strategy is going to do the following. I'm going to take 1 minus CIU of K and spend it on myself, and I'm going to spend CIU of K on my capital investment. So if you add these up, okay, I mean, if you, uh, did I write that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I gotta check the math here. I think I might have typed this wrong. I'll check it and get back to you. Where, where UK is the total amount. What I'm saying here is, is that I'm using CI, I'm taking a certain amount of money. At the end of the day, after I made my money, I pull my money out of the pocket, I look at my capital, and I say, okay, how much am I spending on eating for my family versus in buying another tractor, or another rake, or another shovel? Uh, what percentage am I going to spend on each? Okay? CI just represents that percentage. Okay? Next, here's what happens I'm going to have no wealth distribution. Okay, in other words, remember our wealth distribution policy from before? I'm going to have no democracy. Uh, all I'm going to have is CI representing the percent of my personal spending that I spend on capital. So the first value is CI equal 0.01, that is 1%. If I spend a dollar on, on myself eating today, I'm going to spend one penny helping to buy investing in a shovel. Okay? Uh, then 0.035, or 3.5%, or 4%. So I'm going, to, I'm going to take three people, they're just disconnected, and this is person one on the top, person two, person three, just like I've done in the past. And then I've got income one, oh, surprise there, zero to two. Remember our poor guy is making between, um, making an average of a dollar a day, that is making between zero and two dollars a day. Uh, this is the spending on, um, of themselves, uh, okay, is the blue. The red at the bottom going like noisy is the invest in the shovel, okay? This is the donations, it just stays at zero because there's no wealth distribution, there's no democracy. Capital, here, this is a little more interesting. So, um, what happens here, this guy, uh, remember is, is the 0.01 case. This person is taking 1% of, of what they're spending in total and putting it towards capital. Mm -hmm. And that investment doesn't pay off. Okay? Just stays there. But because it's got the poor get poor curve in there. But if you invest it 3.5%, look what happens. Wham! Because the person's investing in a shovel and it's giving them a return. They're getting in money from it. In fact, I take that and show it. <coughs> this capital improvement is giving this person income. You see how their income went up? It went up over $2 a day. They invest in the shovel, they're more efficient, they're selling more product at the market, they're making more money. They raise their own salary by not saving this time, but investing. Okay? And the same sort of thing happens in this case when you, you invest uh, 4%. Okay? And you see that this, everything gets better for this person, these people that invest a little bit. right? Because this guy here, well, he starts spending more on himself too. Right? This guy spends more on himself. These guys, 
Remember this plot, the error plot? It was the difference between desired wealth and actual wealth. Okay, well, on the top one, it's hardly regulated good. Down here, it's regulated well. In other words, these people in the bottom that invested are making more money, they're able to consistently save money at a level that they want to have. In other words, whatever it was here, $25 a day, that to, on hand in case they had a health problem. Okay, so you can see that it matters a lot. You remember the message with the, the poor guy in the PID? It was basically, this person's got a tough time because they're gonna suffer in order to save, they're gonna suffer no matter what, but they may as well suffer to save, okay? In this case, when you look at it, it's like, well, they might suffer a little in order to invest, right? Because there's, I mean, if I got a dollar a day and I spend a penny, well, that's 1% less food, let's say. Okay. But the beauty of it is, is if they go up and invest a little bit more, suddenly they start getting returns and they raise their own salary. Okay. I mean, this, is, this isn't surprising, right? This is, these kind of concepts work for us. Invest in the stock market, right? Same, it's the same sort of thing. Um, next, let's add a democracy in. So in this case, um, it's, it's like all the previous simulations with, with wealth distribution. You know, I look at my neighbors, I take the poorest one, I take the generosity factor, I multiply by the difference, and I transfer that wealth. That idea is there. The democracy is exactly the same as before, okay? But now I've got this capital investment thing going on. We are not here transferring capital. We're only cap transferring money from pocket to pocket, okay? So um, you can see uh, the red means um, they're donating to one, and blue is, is donated by one. So this guy, this guy up here is getting more donations than he's getting. But he's the guy in the tough position because he hasn't invested, right? He isn't getting a return on investment. His in income isn't too bad because why? Because these guys are donating to him, raising essentially his income and how much he can spend on himself. And yet, they're, both of them are doing quite a bit better than them in terms of spending on himself, okay? So, uh, you can look at it and say, well, um, does the democracy help the situation? Um, from the, pers the poor person's perspective at the top, or you could say from the person's perspective that's got bad behavior because they're not investing, okay? Sure, it's helping them. Well, if they're getting more donations, they're essentially raising their income by being irresponsible. Would it be, would it be possible for them to donate capital? So for example, if either a second or third person donated just a little bit of their capital, they would go back up. Whereas if the first person got a little bit of capital, they might shoot up as well. Yes, I think I think you could model that and study it. I think that the, that in fact it may makes a lot of sense. That's sort of like saying the way I think of it, if I hand you cash you're just blowing and spending your money. If I hand you capital, what's capital often? Technology, right? So you're right. I mean, you hand somebody technology and suddenly they're gonna ride this curve and make their own money. You don't have to give them any more money. It can make a lot of sense. Okay, um, the voting um, is not surprising. Um, the generosity level comes up to here. Um, the, uh, the poor guy is the, the black line. He, he, he wants money all the time. The other two are voting. Um, at least later on against it. Um, this, is, uh, this is Sachs's idea, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have no wealth distribution or democracy, and what I'm gonna do is try to evaluate how much money I should give someone so that they can invest enough in capital and still feed themselves so that it'll take off and they'll get a return investment on their capital mm -hmm. Uh, and they won't have to be reliant anymore. So this is Sachs's idea of breaking the poverty trap by just giving people something, get them up on the uh, outside of that poverty trap so things take off. So if you look at what goes on, uh, I'm gonna take 10, 12, and 15. I'm gonna go halfway through the person's life, I'm gonna hand them $10. That's what that represented. It went down, it wasn't enough money. In other words, what happened is they perturbed, they were poor, really poor, Perturbed, they were still in the poverty trap, so they went back down. And, and didn't, you know, Sachs is saying, well, the reason aid has failed is because we haven't given enough aid. We haven't broken people out of poverty traps. Um, 
Unfortunately, 12 doesn't do it either. I just kept tweaking up, right? When I tweak up to 15, all of a sudden it goes, boom! Person makes money, they're on their own, everything's cool. Okay? So, it is interesting, I mean, the, the idea when you do these simulations, this is a much more complex version of a simulation than what Sachs had in mind, but it, it seems to work. Okay? Next, I'm going to add in democracy and provisioning and, well, it doesn't change much, actually. Um, you, you, you still have this thing where you have to invest 15 in order to get it to jump and, and save that guy. Um, it is interesting, though, if you want to have some fun with the simulation, you can actually show in the simulation, I didn't want to assign this as a homework because it's a little tricky, but it should be, if you think about wealth distribution and democracy, it should be the case that you can break a poverty trap with less provisioning if you have wealth distribution and democracy, right? Because you're sharing wealth. Poor guy's getting money, so he can invest more. So you should be able to, you should be able to find the trip point when it goes from here to here, and that trip point should change, be different, should be lower if you have a democracy in place, right? I've done the simulations before and uh, it works. I mean, the problem is, is that when I say trip point, it's not that accurate. It's more of a fuzzy trip point because this is all stochastic and therefore some, if you get right near the trip point, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and you get a bit above, then it'll start working. It's, it's a little tricky. That's why I didn't, um, I assigned it as a homework last year, but I decided it was too nasty to do this year. I'm getting old. Um, okay, questions, comments? Okay, um, I just want to mention a few things, then we're out of here. I'm sorry. We're oh, we got we got a minute, two minutes. Um, I want you. I want. I want to emphasize something. You know, all these simulations really make sense, but um, you know, a simulation is based on a mathematical model, and if the model is wrong. Everything you're doing is wrong. Computer scientists say garbage in, garbage out, right? Well, there's many ways of saying that in engineering, but look, if the model's wrong, this is all wrong. Um, so where could we have problems? Um, in, the, in the PID case, um, actually, if you think through the PID case, it's so simple that there is hardly anything that can be wrong. That's the beauty of the PID case. That's the case I have most confidence in, in terms of correctness. But things get worse from there. The wealth distribution strategy um, plus the democracy is quite unrealistic in many ways. Uh, think about it. How many people are going to give each other money? I mean, don't ask me for money after class. I'm not giving you money. Okay, <coughs> so would you really do it, you know? If Tyler found out that Courtney was broke, would he give her half his, half his wealth? No. Okay, so it's really quite un un unreasonable. Um, <clears throat> even though some religions demand it. So the question is, what's reasonable? Turns out if you study the way poor people behave, it's incredible. They, they run very, as you saw from Energy and Duffalo, they run very sophisticated financial lives. One of the things they do quite often is loans to each other, loans to with friends, family, they often have many loans going on at once. That it, it, we could simulate that pretty easy, actually. I've considered going back and just changing everything to just handing loans out. I think qualitatively, it's not going to be all that much different, actually. I mean, it's it's going to matter, but so so there are inaccuracies in this. In modeling a democracy, um, there's certainly problems with that. It's broadly conceptually right but it certainly doesn't represent any country on the face of the earth. Um, okay, next. Um, unfortunately, I have no validation for the capital dynamics and poverty trap um, or the technology diffusion. Um, if you try to get those numbers, alpha, beta, and K, for instance, that's difficult for a country, um, especially for the developing world. You might be able to get that for the U.S., but are you going to be able to get it you know, for, I don't know, pick your country, developing country. So that's, 
And then there's problems with modeling the democracy that way. There's a problem with my, I just willy-nilly took the country level model that Sachs and his colleagues produced about the capital growth equation. And I just said, oh, this is work for an individual too. One person versus, you know, 50 million people. That's completely unrealistic perhaps. But when I read about individual models of economic growth, they, they're pretty closely related, but I don't have a validated model. In other words, I couldn't show you a person on Earth that would fit that model necessarily. But you could say that about a circuit, right? Take a circuit, write down Kirchhoff's voltage laws, current laws, write down a linear model of it. Is there any circuit in the universe that fits that model? Answers, no, absolutely not. There's no such thing as a linear system in practice. That's a scary thought, isn't it? There's things that approximate a linear system, but not a linear system. Okay, um, so I avoid all kinds of specific numbers, and I sort of talk about qualitative issues. And 